Hello everyone, my name is Jeffrey Rutledge, basketball official with the Illinois High School Association. I was asked by Sam Knox to give a presentation about a topic that I had covered in the past at the 2019 Officials Conference. The topic I will be covering today is called Team Officiating in Your Primary Coverage Area. I want to thank Sam Knox for the opportunity to present this to you statewide. I hope your family is safe and let's get into the topic. Okay, let's get started. Uh, first of all, the topic is team officiating in your primary coverage area. And again, I think one of the reasons that I always want to talk about this is because as in all the levels that I have done and all the things that I've done, officiating is a team sport. Um, a lot of times we think of officiating as just this um, thing that we are doing where maybe with a three-person crew or two-person crew and I have to do my job well actually it is a team effort and working within your group okay first off you do have a primary coverage area but you also have team responsibilities that help the crew because one of the things that they do not do is they do not say well that official missed that play they say the crew missed that play or the crew did not get that rule right it's not just the individual that is participating now again a little background uh, just some bullet points this is my 25th year um, officiating uh, high school basketball in the state of Illinois uh, and in general uh, I'm a three-time state final official unfortunately I'm the last one of the last three people to work a boys uh, state final in the state of Illinois and, and of the last decade that's unfortunate which there was something this year but I've been a clinician since 2007 and I've been on the IHSA conference committee since 2008. Um, I, I've taught officials classes. I've um, the past president of the longest running organization in the country called the Athletic Officials Association and I'm currently on the basketball committee for the Central Officials Association. So that's just a little background about me. Okay, we're going to talk about all these things uh, coming up. So what is team officiating? What does that mean? So we're going to kind of cover this in your primary, secondary coverage areas, uh, calling the obvious, trusting your partner, uh, know when to help, double whistles, and throughout we'll have some videos, some you make the calls, but we'll also have some videos to kind of highlight the points as well. Okay, let's start with primary and secondary calls and coverage areas, okay? So first of all, we have to work our primary hard. That is actually a very big key to what we're doing. Work your primary hard. You have responsibilities. You need to be able to officiate that area really hard and do your responsibility. Do your job, as Bill Belichick would say with the uh, New England Patriots. Do your job, and that's what you're first asked to do. Do your job. Then let's look for competitive matchups. So if you don't know necessarily what that is, so if something is going on in your primary, we want to first look for competitive matchups. Players that are actively doing stuff. Now, the ball and usually a defender is an easy one. But when you're off ball, there's also areas in which you want to do a look for your competitive matchup and competitive matchups with players. Okay, know when to help, okay? There's several situations, but these are some of the more common situations. Things like illegal screens, rebounding action, and non-basketball plays. So what I mean by illegal screens is oftentimes a legal screen is coming from a players coming from another uh, primary coverage area into somebody else's primary coverage area or it's crossing over in a dual coverage area oftentimes an on-ball official for example is not seeing the screener coming so you have to know when to help officiate that play even when the ball is around and especially if it's off ball there are screens that take place that might set free a shooter or set free a pass or make an uh, easy layup take place 
Rebounding is another one. Uh, rebounding has a, the players are spread out. Once the ball is shot, especially the primary coverage official might be looking at the sh at the shooter and the defender. They are not in a help mode when it comes to the rebounding until maybe after the shot or the shooter has come back to the floor. So we got to help out with those things as well. A non basketball play. Simply all that means is something that's not related to actually playing the game. Maybe some uh, rough action, some fighting action, some taunting, things that don't have anything. It's, it's always good to be some, an official to help your partner in this, even if it's not in your primary coverage area. So let's get to some other things. So let's discuss what our primary coverage areas are and what they are, first of all. Okay, first off, the lead official. Okay, the lead official has a primarily an area in the paint, outside the paint, uh, inside the three-point line area, and they're on the, on the side that they are on, it is their half of the court. So this is the lead's primary coverage area in the gold or yellowish area. The trail has is on the same side of the lead official, but has pretty much everything outside of that, above the free throw, outside the three-point line. And they have the circle. They have what we call 60% of the court above the free throw line uh, area. And they have things like the division line is, is their primary coverage area. They also have their sideline that they are associated with. And they also have the end line as well on the other end of the court. The lead, if I didn't make it clear, has the entire end line uh, as their coverage area for out-of-bounds purposes. And then the center has all the other area. They have half of the lane, and they have the 40% above the free throw line. And they also have up until the division line. Now, these are your primary coverage areas. But as play evolves, as a play moves around, we should move or adjust to our area. So even the lead can rotate to the other side, making the center the trail. The point is, is that we have to understand what our primary coverage is first before we can extend our coverage to a secondary area. And just as a general rule, because this is probably where the most confusion comes in when it comes to a secondary coverage area, to a certain extent, everybody has a secondary coverage area in the lane. Based off of where the ball is, where the ball came from, it is very possible that all three officials could be looking at the lane at some point and have a different angle on where the ball is or another player. So let's not get so caught up into who has the ball and where it is. That means no one else can call something. In the lane, it is very possible to have three whistles or double whistles in this case just because you have an angle that's better. If the play is on even on the side of the lead side and the center might have a clear look where the lead and the trail might be screened off we have to understand that we can come and get plays into our secondary area and this the lane is one of the biggest hot spots for that to take place okay let's talk about calling the obvious this is something that we need to do a better job of is basically to make your games run smooth. If you call the obvious, usually your game will go a lot smoother. So, some things to think about. Can the person from the top row see the, the play? This is basically the comment where can the grandmother from way up top see the play and see that it's a foul? If that's the case, it might be something you need to call. Those are the type of plays you want to call consistently. Does it show up on video? Now, this is not something you're going to know, obviously, when you're calling the game, but it might be something that, look, if based on where cameras are located, if this took place, it probably showed up on video. Can you beat the tape? Even when you're making a no call, is this something that clearly shows up on tape and, and backs you up one way or the other, whether you made a call or not? 
And do you have or do you use slow motion replay to determine if the call is correct? This is one really more that deals with, I would say, mostly violations like traveling or sometimes even like a double dribble or maybe even a backcourt violation. If we got to slow the play down so much to the, po to the point to where we have to, that's the only way we can see the violation and sometimes even the foul, it probably is something that we don't don't need to call or if it's something that we got a slow mo and that's the only verification and nobody said anything it might be the best thing to not have a call again we call a lot of things we we were going to make mistakes but this is just a guide so call the obvious as much as you possibly can let's start with this play look at the time the score and most of all the position of the two officials where is the ball going in this situation? Sky from the corner, from the wind. Hold on. Hold on. Did I hear a whistle? The lead official in this play clearly has nothing else to officiate and gives help to his trail official on this play. Time and score clearly dictates the lead extending their coverage or giving help. Is this good help by the center official in this play? Number seven. McSwing is very late whistle from the official furthest from the play. And the foul is on Worthington. Does everyone in the gym see this as a foul? You make the call here. Let's say if you watch the replay, you don't see much contact either, do you? much none <laughs> and so, so should the center official in this play do a better job and trust their partner the uh, ghost foul on emory <laughs> at the end of the pacific game one more look is this play an elephant or an ant Should the trail come and make a call on this play? Two issues here. The center gives an improper signal for a block shot. Then secondly, the trail comes in and makes a call, probably an inadvertent whistle, and, and decides that this is a foul. All right, let's get into trusting your partner and really what that means. Okay, first of all, let your partner or partners call their area first, okay? One of the things that a lot of younger officials do, especially officials that get newer into three-person, is that they will oftentimes try to feel like they see something, they must call it. Well, you must recognize, like I said in the earlier part of this video, what is your primary coverage area? So allow your partners to call their area first because they probably saw the entire play. They probably are, are, are or decided one way or the other, it is just best to give them the shot or at least the first shot of calling what is taking place in their area. Now, this doesn't mean I want you to completely ignore obvious fouls or violations, but they got to be obvious. They cannot be things that only you saw and 
only you and maybe one other person saw, this is where I talk about calling the obvious. Call the things that everyone can see. Now, they are just this is a game of angles so one of the things that happens with angles is depending on the angle you may miss something so if your partner misses something that is completely obvious and based on mechanic and based on your angle you have an obvious look at it then make the call if need be but don't go and nitpick something in your partner's area that they had an opportunity to see the whole thing this is a big one, especially with two person and three person, uh, especially with newer officials to get to three person. Do not ball watch under any circumstances. Do not ball watch. If the ball is out of your primary coverage area, try to pick up something else from your, your coverage area. And then if you are going to watch something outside of your area, it probably shouldn't be the ball in most cases. This is a big mistake from newer officials or officials newer to the three-person game. Okay, when the ball is not in your primary, find a competitive matcher somewhere, even if I would say it's not in your area. Now, what I mean by this is when the ball is away, we're not watching the ball, we might watch a screen coming, as I said. We might watching for guys uh, jostling for position in the paint uh, to, to set up a post play, maybe to get a screen to get a pass for an open look. Look at something else. Even if there's nothing in your primary coverage area, it is always good to look for something in a competitive matchup somewhere that you can help because maybe part of that play started in your area, might have ended up in someone's area, and, and the official that's on the ball might be watching that play but see it late or didn't see the whole play. So find the competitive matchup somewhere else on the court. Now, here's an example of a center side drive that takes place often. Okay, in this case, if you understand the three-person mechanics, we have the trail and the lead is supposed to be ball side, but let's say the ball gets swung over to the center side of the court and now that player goes hard to the basket. The lead did not have a chance to make a rotation. So here we have A as the ball carrier uh, goes to the basket, B defends them, and there's a crash. This is a play that the center will be likely calling and should be likely calling. For one, it's on their side of the lane. It's not even in the paint, and they probably saw the beginning of the play. Now, someone might say, well, B is a secondary defender. Yes, they are. But if they are the ones and the C is doing their job, they probably saw that secondary defender coming. Expect a whistle from the center. That is calling your primary. And again, this is something you should talk about often in your pregame of how you want to handle this. But when I talk about this in my pregame, I often talk about this as this is the center's play initially. Okay, Doesn't mean the lead can't have anything, just means it's the center's play initially. Here's an example of trusting your partner. Play is in front of the lead and has a clear look at the entire play, the start, the middle, and the end. The center and the trail do not have an angle that tells them otherwise that this is a foul. Now let's get into double whistles as I was discussing. Actually, double whistles are okay. There's this thought process with a lot of officials that, oh, we shouldn't have a double whistle. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, in the lane which I talked about earlier, double whistles are very common. A player that goes to the lane, double whistles are very possible. Now, should we have them all the time? No. But it's okay to have some double whistles throughout the course of a game. Primary officials should take these plays, or if they call a foul, or, or really a violation as well, let them take it if they are going to the table. Okay, so if we have a, dual of, a, a double whistle, we should talk about this. Let the primary official that made the call take to the 
to to the table and report it now let me make this clear there's exceptions to this so if there are times where you have called maybe three or four fouls and sometimes that happens you can call three or four in a row and it might even be all against the same team it might be a good idea to give those up but i'll explain that a little bit a little more so a secondary official should have what we call a cadence whistle Basically, what you're doing is you're recognizing that a foul, maybe even a violation is taking place, but you're giving the primary official an opportunity to make that call. Give them the opportunity. If they do not come up with it and you clearly saw the play or your angle just happens to be better, then come up what we call a cadence whistle, kind of a half a second, maybe a second and a half late, and blow the whistle to make the call. Then at least you are telling your partner, I gave you a shot and then I made the call. Or maybe you're processing it to say, mm, maybe is it a foul, isn't it? Yes, it's a foul. My partner doesn't have a whistle. Now I come in and get a whistle. Nothing wrong with that. And again, this is kind of what I talked about. Know who had the most whistles. And, and really what I mean is in a short sequence. If you've had like three or four in a row or you haven't had any, and then now a partner is making a call on a double whistle, it's okay to give it up to the non-primary official every now and then. First off, it makes it look like you're on the same page. Even if you, even if you both might have had something a little different. Now, if you have something different, that's di that's a that's a completely different situation. Then maybe you need to discuss it. But if you have the same thing, let the other official take it. Sometimes don't have to be the one who is making all the calls. Um, a lot of us get in the habit where we're calling a lot of things, and then now the focus focuses on the one official that is calling everything instead of us as a team working together and, and giving up some of those plays. And the trail and center, and especially in a three-person game, should do on a regular basis, do what we call a post and hold. Okay, and all that means is, is that, that the trail and the center should call the foul, put their arm up, post that they got a foul, hold, especially on plays in the lane, and just wait to see if there is by any chance another official that has a whistle, especially the lead. And the main reason we want to do this is to avoid a possible blarge or some kind of confusing play where we're calling something different and we didn't recognize that our partner had that call. Okay, this is a situation for a possible double whistle, and this is kind of what I'm talking about. So, kind of the same thing we talked about with a seaside drive, but it's more in the lane. And really, I don't really care in this situation if the lead or the center takes it. It is technically, I guess, on the center side, but we also talk about people will say a secondary defender is coming up, and the lead might have a better look at that secondary defender, especially if there's a beat defender in the C's area. This is a time when the center should post and hold and do nothing but just make sure there's no other whistle. The lead also should recognize this and kind of kind of wait or make sure they there's another whistle. Sometimes we blow our whistle at the same exact time and we don't hear the other whistle. So it's just taking a second to recognize, does my partner have something? And if my partner doesn't have something, then I go out and make the call. If we both have something, we might make some eye contact, even some a nod or whatever we talked about in our pregame to make sure that one official only makes the call. Because the worst thing we want to have here is where the center has a block and the lead has a charge we have both signaled that call and now we have a what we call a large or a double foul situation which we have to adjudicate with a double foul no one's going to be happy with us we've called two, a foul on each player and we may have counted the basket we may not have counted the basket we may have to figure out who we're going to give the ball to the AP arrow it has all kind of implications make sure that we wait and take our time Time on these type of plays even if it's a few seconds no one's going to care as and then if the coach or some player asks you well what did you have coach had the same thing what are they going to say to you 
They can't say anything. Now, you may talk about it later in the locker room. You may have a discussion about who should have taken it in that case. But if this happens, and it might happen once or twice a game, if you do it correctly, you will survive that game. And that's really what you want to do in the end of the day. This is an example of good patience by the lead in the center on a double whistle. Here's a play for both the lead and the center in transition. Does the lead give the center an opportunity to make a call on this play? Nasty. Did they call the charge? We're talking it over. Most of the players are heading down to the Newman Central Catholic side. Todd Tripp telling his kids to wait. Well, the old block charge call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could be the judge on that one. It could, it could on. have gone either way. It could go on for days. Yeah. Yes. This is a double whistle that the lead does not give the center an opportunity to call a foul that is clearly on their side of the lane and in their primary coverage area. Good job for the center to at least hold and post before making a signal so there is no blarge. This is a play in transition that the center and the lead have in the lane. Good job for both officials to hold before signaling so there's no conflicting signals. As a general practice, this is still probably the lead's primary coverage area. But as long as there's no signals, either official can theoretically take this to the table. This is a pass and crash situation coming from the center's primary into the lead's coverage area. The center does the proper job and posts and holds and lets the lead take this foul. Even though both officials have the same exact call, there's no need for there to be in a hurry to, for both officials to make a ruling. Okay, let's know when to help. Now, this is when do we come outside of our primary coverage area. I kind of touched on this a little bit. Again, call when the call stands out or is obvious when it's so obvious to everyone that's a foul that's a violation oh my god he i cannot believe that happened kind of play those are the great times to help get the elephants okay if if i'm in a circus i know every time when i see an elephant at a circus if they even have them anymore but if we have a circus and there's an elephant that walks across the stage or walks in the field we know when there's an elephant now with an ant they're much smaller we have no clue in case unless we get right up close on it. So make sure that you call the plays that everyone can see of going across the court as opposed to the things that you are the only one that can see. Get the elephants. If we get elephants, our games will go a lot smoother. If we call ants, our games can be very difficult because then they'll be asking for ants all the time for you to call. 
rough and excessive contact. This should be pretty self-explanatory. So these are things that might be even outside the game that might need to address on upgrading. These are situations. This doesn't even apply just to situations that you call. It might be something you are a secondary. You might be really far away, but you are helping giving your partner information when they make one of these calls with excessive because maybe if it's intentional they might have called something regular and you might say to them even though you didn't blow your whistle hey you might want to think about upgrading about that or ask them what they saw so that we can make the right call and again non-basketball plays fights I mean even though that could be excessive and rough taunting things that may come up up and down the court that may not be primarily in your area or maybe something that happens across I always love when my partners come and get these kind of plays because I might be concentrating on the ball or something directly that's in front of me and I may not see right off to the side these kids are going at it with each other and if my partner comes and get it I don't care where they are on the court they see it and they need to get it that's all that matters get the non-basketball plays this is a good job of the trail official calling a travel in front of the lead Darvin working his way a little closer he traveled again the trail official and a three person should pick up the feet anytime the ball is deep in the leads area this is a good job. Let's watch this play completely develop as there's a hold that the lead calls outside of his primary coverage area. As you can see, there is one competitive matchup, but that competitive matchup takes him to a hot spot where there's a hold on a cutting player. The lead is probably the only official that has a good angle on this particular play. Angle over distance is often how we can get plays right as well. The lead extends his coverage to call a play that is clearly a foul in front of the trail. Are there any competitive matchups for the lead to only be paying attention to? If the answer is no, then the lead can extend their coverage. This is a play that must be called. The center sees an obvious foul call in front of the lead that is not called, which instead would have been an out-of-bounds play the center does a good job and gives patience and makes the foul call. Okay, here's an example of some transition coverage, kind of to illustrate what I'm talking about and kind of what one of the videos was, was showing or will show. So we have a play that's coming up the court. Now, this is primarily the trail's responsibility. But in this case, the trail looks like they are possibly screened or maybe doesn't have the bad or great angle or might have even been surprised by the contact. So who can come in on this situation and possibly save the day? 
the center official because the center official has an open look. They can see between the players. The trail, in this case, probably is looking through the back of the offensive player and doesn't have an angle of whether the defender was in legal guarding position at the time of contact. The lead is in a situation where they cannot help and not help as easily. So these are things that we have to think about when we are talking about these plays to help. This is an illustration of the diagram, but in real time. A play at the division line that has an extreme crash needs to be called. And the center official across the court properly gets involved and makes a call here. This is not a play that can simply be ignored because it's outside of your primary coverage area. But once again, when we're in transition, we need to work as a team and help each other out when possible. And this is when it is possible. Okay, let's talk about giving help. Let's talk about giving help for a moment. So again, you must be 100% of what you saw, okay? So, if, and, and again, the key to this is because the uh, calling official might be on to something else, might have watched something, may didn't see the whole play. So you've got to be 100% of what you call. Do not make a call for your partner. If they have seen the play and they have, have decided, and again, this comes sometimes with experience, sometimes their body language, sometimes that you can see their eyes, you can kind of know that they saw the entire thing. Don't just make a call for them because they didn't make something. Don't try to save the game by just making a call because what you might do is you might cause some actual, uh, you might cause some, actual uh, conflict between your partners. You do not want to do that as a result of just coming to get something. Discuss any administrative type of plays, especially with technical fouls, intentional fouls, flagrant fouls. The reason this is big, and this is not even during live ball, if your partner calls a technical foul, especially, and this is something I talk about in my pregames all the time, if my partner calls a technical foul, I want to make sure that I get to my partner and discuss what just happened because it's very possible that when a technical foul takes place, you as a calling official are kind of either emotional about it, you're, you might be even a lot of debate about it. I want to make sure that I talk to my partner and say, okay, what just happened? Because if you gave a technical on a coach, it might be very different than if you gave one on a player. I might want you to, you might want to talk to the coach if you gave a technical on a player. What if it's bench personnel? Things of that nature, kind of to get you to kind of tell me what just happened. Also with some of these fouls, there's something else that happened right before it. So a technical foul is not unusual to have a regular foul or a common foul or a shooting foul, but right before the foul that you just called. So one of the reasons I want to get with my partner, so like, okay, so, okay, so, okay, I'll get the shooter, we'll go to this end, and then we got to go back to this end or something like that. Intentional and flagrant fouls are the same way we might have to discuss how many free throws we're going to shoot. If the ball went in the basket, um, was it a three-point shot that was missed? Um, is someone going to be disqualified from the game, like a flagrant foul? We need to be able to discuss it so that we're all on the same page. The last thing we want to do is go to the go and shoot free throws and do it all out of sequence because we didn't realize other information played a part. Maybe we even have someone that get a technical foul that was supposed to shoot, and now they're disqualified from the game. So this is something we got to get together on very often to discuss 
how we are going to adjudicate these and make sure that we do it in order or to make sure that we have the right people shooting for the right reasons in the right circumstances and maybe even explain it to the coaches or the participants if need be or get completely away from them if we need to be but this is never something because I call a technical foul my partner should just never find out what's happened or as your as if you called it make sure that you give them the information before we get moving to the next play and again ask for help if you don't have the entire picture and this sometimes happens with technical files but for example I call a file and there's an issue of whether the ball went in the basket I might ask hey did the ball go in the basket I know he shot it but I didn't look because I was watching them go and fall out of bounds or other things that took place the balls in the air when I called the foul did the ball count even you should even give help in some of these situations if you have a, something that brings information to the table it's not unusual for me when on a, on a shooting file if I don't see my partner signal that the ball basket counted I might tell them the ball went in I'm not telling them at all what I'm not telling them at all whether to count the basket I'm just giving them information so that they know the ball went in so they can decide if they had a shooting foul or not and make it clear to everybody that's participating. This is an out of bounds play where the lead is asking for help on a play that is knocked out of bounds on his line. The lead clearly does not exactly know who touched the ball last and asked for help. The center official cross the court properly gives that information. Again, this information is not a secret. It is not to be hidden. Just give the signal and give help. And then the lead properly also signals at the end of the play. This is a situation where the lead does not see the entire play. The center gives information to get the call changed. And here's five. It doesn't matter. That's a quick three. Harms. And it's going to stay in the possession of Purdue. Once again, Harms. I think Boborowski saw it differently. And the officials come together. And they'll put the ball in the hands of Tony Bennett's cap. The lead in this play has no competitive matchups and picks up a screener at the top of the key. Cassius Winston buries another one and they just ran hard into a Torres pick and while he's down on the ground they get the foul on Torres. Yeah, nobody called out that screen for Cassius Winston. He ran into a brick wall. As shown in this diagram, the lead clearly does not have a competitive matchup in their primary coverage area and picks up a potential screener and has a great look at whether or not this is a legal or an illegal screen and properly calls it. The screen was illegal as much as it was painful. Nobody called it out. Yeah. This is an example of almost oblarge by the trail and center officials. Grant Williams picking one on one. Push Travis out of the way. Oh! One official was going to call an offensive foul. The second said block. The first guy was ready to pull off that. I mean, he the was the ready. The guy said, no, 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 block. And he gave in to the first guy. Wow. Okay, 
even though in this case the trail has not actually signaled a player control foul, their body language suggested that they were going to call a player control foul. Still, this is a play where the trail needs a little bit more patience in making this call. This is a good example of the crew getting together to call a timeout instead of a five-second violation. Allen thinking they're calling a timeout here for Arizona. Randy McCall overruled the other official by saying that Arizona called a timeout. Parker Jackson Cartwright called it on the floor. Standing right next to the referee. Good teamwork by the crew working together to make sure they get a timeout that was properly requested before a violation. And the third official does a wonderful job explaining that and helping his partner out as well. Look at the teamwork in this play. Respectively, streaming live in the ESPN app. A steal for Moore. Who will take it the distance? Whoa, Dallas Moore. That's actually going to be a technical foul on Aaron Bonniger. Smacked the basketball out of the hands of Terrell as he's taking the basketball out of bounds. And that's where you get your emotions get the best of you. But you see, he and his teammates talking to Bodinger about controlling his emotions. You see the dunk were right there. Bodinger smacking the basketball out of Terrell's hand. Look at the location of the new trail and see if he can see this slap of the basketball. The center does a wonderful job staying engaged in the play and catching an obvious violation of the rules. This cannot be ignored and the center extends his coverage and properly calls a technical foul. Does the lead need to come and get this play? On offense because Notre Dame is capable of scoring points. Bridges got fouled. He doesn't get it to go. That was unusual for that, that was a really for one of the first times in this ball game. Actually, for the first time, and he got there on a jump shot, not on taking the. Because the lead has not rotated, this is all the way the center's call. The center stays engaged and calls this properly. The lead is likely extending their coverage without making a full rotation. This is probably something the lead should leave alone. This is an example of a cadence whistle. The center sees a clear foul on the arm and allows and waits for the lead to make a call or the trail and once they don't, blows the whistle. Okay, let's get to some you make the calls. And some of these are just plays I want to show to kind of see how we work together as a team. Okay, here's a play with a block charge in the middle of the court, but not so much focused on the play. but the reaction by the crew uh, for after the reaction of the coach. And a technical foul, I believe, has also been levied against Kermit Davis. All three officials are involved in the dead ball officiating. An official called the block charge, an official gave a technical foul, and another official comes and addresses the coach. Have their 
Okay, here we have an illegal screen that happens in front of the center official. The lead official is in an attempt to rotate on this play. The center official's in great position to see this on his own, but what if he doesn't get this foul, or what if he doesn't see the play clearly? The lead extends his coverage and is able to help on this play. This is a blarge. Both the lead and the center give competing signals. Whose call is this? Robinson has checked into the game for the first time as a whistle is blown. And guess who took it? Neither official posts and holds on this play, which results in conflicting signals and a blarge. Avoid this situation at all costs. All three officials should be engaged on this play whether they have a foul or not. Just because this is in the lane does not mean this is only the lead's call. Right back at it. Two misses from in tight. Hernandez ahead O'Neal. Here come the Spartans. Here we have a transition play where both the center and the lead have some coverage on this play. The lead is not in a good spot to probably see this, and the center stays engaged and still officiates the play and makes a signal. The only issue, it might be raising your hand because there's a potential your partner could have a call. Is the lead the proper official for this block charge play? Is the center still engaged in this play that is kind of going away from him? Coming out of a timeout, the white team has six players that enter the court. When is this a tactical foul? And ask yourself, do the officials communicate with each other properly in order to adjudicate this correctly? During a critical part of the game, should the officials have come together and discussed the rule at hand? This has now concluded the presentation for team officiating in your primary coverage area. If you have any questions of me, Jeffrey Rutledge, the presenter of this presentation, please feel to email me at officiatingborn at gmail.com. 
Also, you may contact the Illinois High School Association office, Sam Knox, Kurt Gibson, or Beth Souser as well if there's anything that you need clarification on. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a good off season. Stay safe, and good luck in the upcoming basketball season.